has been so long now that I have all but forgotten what it is like to be a man. The sensation of emotions in my chest, the wonderful sting of wine on my palate, the caress of a breeze upon my skin, the delightful, soft touch of a woman, all these things and more have departed. Now there is solitude. The concept of time is shattered. I dwell alone, with my vague memories as my only friends. Notions which perish before they can even be seized swim aimlessly through the whole of my mind. There is one memory that is complete, though, a single clear lens through which I can peer, a solitary recollection which can cause me to feel, at least to an extent. That extent is a road I travel frequently, combing over every detail I can manage to recall. I am the starved dog that cannot die off, desperately searching the same alley over and over for any scraps neglected among the rubble. Though the memory is wrought of pain, it is all that remains of what once was. It is the only thing that I am certain is real. And even that is starting to fade, despite my many attempts to preserve it. Where should I even begin? I suppose I should start with my name. Vincent Klausner, I was called once. I believe I was named after my father. Or perhaps my name was similar to his. I have come to the conclusion that this was of importance. Unfortunately, the meaning behind this naming system I cannot recall. There is the ghost of a concept in me, that there was some feeling underlying a name. This association or connection no longer is comprehensive and serves only to my vexation. Thus, I generally keep it from my mind. I had a wife as well. Her name was Magda, with hair the color of a woods at dusk, skin like milk in dawn's light, and eyes that held the keys to my every comfort. Despite all my efforts, I cannot recall how we came to be betrothed. I am aware that we held a great emotion between us, known as love. How this began, and in what fashion it developed, is at once my greatest mystery and my greatest tribulation. Despite my lack of sensation, I have utmost conviction that she was dear to me above all else. I cannot remember how it came to pass that I was a criminal. I have strained to bring this topic fully into my conscious mind, but it is a fish which cannot be caught. I suspect that I had committed transgressions under the influence of the dark wines which I was commonly known to drink. I do remember how often, and to such great degrees, I would imbibe the crimson black substance. It, perhaps, was my second love. I also remember the shackle of a debtor slave coldly clasped around my ankle. It was a shameful station to hold, to have to work laboriously under demanding keepers, barely above a prisoner or a beast of burden. I was a destitute, a miscreant, a fallen angel fated to work off the cost of damages I had caused under some ill-advised intoxication. I recall the strain endured by my dearest Magda and myself as I transported from employer to employer. Sometimes, I was passed like a pack mule being kicked to whomever would have me. Sometimes, I sought, begged, and pleaded for approved work that would give me a glimmer of hope to one day pay off the debt that was an anchor on my very existence. There is another name which stands stark and bold against the clouded malaise of my thoughts. Von Klein. He was a tall, gaunt man whose face seemed composed entirely of cheekbones and a pointed chin. He was several years my senior, and we met at a time in which I was between jobs, eager for work, lest I be brought back into the custody of the law for neglecting the terms of my debt. Von Klein dressed in drab garments, which seemed partway suited for business and partway suited for messy labor. His breath consistently had the burnt, sweet smell of a pipe smoke. He was a strange man, unlike any I had ever met. He offered me a position at his workshop, and I readily agreed. When I arrived at his establishment the next day, nothing could have prepared me for what I found. It was a tall building with blocked windows, 
stuffed between other structures in a very dense industrial neighborhood. His greeting was brief, and he quickly ushered me inside, setting the multiple door locks back in place. Inside, the air was stuffy and infused with a mixture of strange, acrid scents. The place was full of bins, crates, tables, shelves, and workbenches. Each were crammed with a disarray of papers, books, spare parts, and scrap baubles. The place looked as dirty as it did disorganized. I wondered if it had ever been cleaned or even dusted. So much was the congestion of the interior that we had to weave single file through the clutter to a back room where I was to sign my contract. I don't remember the specific title he referenced, but Von Klein was some sort of wizard or maestro of artifice. He claimed to have several inventions credited to his name, many of which were to the benefit of the city. I was unsure what exactly he needed me for, as I had no knowledge of science, mystical arts, or other such esoteric fields. He explained that my position at the workshop was to perform mostly menial tasks, though the thought of cleaning, let alone organizing the place, was indeed bewildering, but I was in no position to refuse. Grateful to have found employment, I began my new job. I remember Magda being flush with relief and adorning me with kisses from her rose-colored lips. Little did I know the strange doom that awaited in our near future. Von Klein was a temperamental master to work under. Some days he would beset me with such an unreasonable load of tasks that I slaved away even into the night, yet still found myself unable to complete my assignments. Other days, he was so wrapped up in his experimentations that he was oblivious to my very existence. I seemed to recollect several instances in which I found myself sitting around all day, only spotting the eccentric adept at greeting and farewell. His neurotic nature ensured that I was never to be given a key of my own, and thus my fluctuating work hours were arbitrarily dictated by his whims and demands. Such were his conceptions that he would sometimes outburst, claiming it was my fault when some project ended in failure. During one venture in particular, my duties were beyond what I had previously been tasked to do. The whole of the experiment was an enigma to me. There was a variety of odd mixtures kept in alembics and glass containers. Von Klein continually barked commands at me to adjust temperatures and pressures on different devices and to measure out amounts of the foul components involved in the work. My guess is that he was attempting to grow substances on the surface of metals, though the specifics have either been lost to my fugue or I never knew to begin with. The experiment ended abruptly when several of the heated contraptions exploded. Even whilst I lied on the ground with shards of glass in one side of my body, Von Klein berated me, screaming a long-winded procession of insults and swears. I was filled with great anxiety that my work contract was going to end. Yet, the very next day, he let me in as usual, and assigned cleaning chores to me. An indeterminate amount of time passed, and I fulfilled my duties at the workshop as best I could. One day, while sorting through scrap metal and broken machinery in a highly cluttered storage room, I came across a queer sight. By chance, I pulled a thick covering sheet off of some large object. After the dust cloud settled, I saw before me a tank of thick glass which stood more than seven feet tall. It was roughly cylindrical in shape and had a base and top made from iron. Attached to the thing was a complex looking panel complete with levers, glass tubing, and a crank wheel. Despite having been covered in a protective sheet, the tank was absolutely coated in dust. I surmised that this must have been one of Von Klein's oldest experiments in the building. I took out my rags and set to cleaning off the contraption. When I passed over the front of the tank and removed the layer of grime, I saw the interior of the tank was not empty. It was filled with a cloudy liquid of some sort, which varied in consistency from watery to viscous. The substance held the hue of pale blue or green, depending upon the lighting. Something within the haze caught my eye. I stared intently and wiped once more at the glass stained with age. Indeed, there was a figure inside the blurring fluids, 
still, and upright. It appeared as some sort of construct fashioned in the shape of a man. Its face was vague, with few discernible features. The form of the thing was composed of some kind of pallid metal that had corroded in many areas. A glass tube extended from the control panel into the construct's mouth, as if ready to administer some sort of fuel or catalyst. An outstanding aspect of the metal man that struck me was the fact that its joints were held together so seamlessly. It must have taken an artisan countless painstaking hours to craft such a well-fitted form, I thought. Soon, I realized that looking upon the thing in the tank was beginning to unsettle me. I had never before seen such a work of strange alchemy. I was not prepared for its sudden and immediate presence. As well, some nuance held within the seemingly emotionless gaze had crept into me. I backed up a clumsy step and knocked a bucket of metal pieces off a table. Von Klein was suddenly at the door. What was that? He looked at me, perturbed. I'm sorry, I was just cleaning and... Oh! You have found Kaiser. Kaiser? Yes, he was beautiful once. He was to be my greatest creation. A melancholy briefly washed over Von Klein as his eyes affixed on the tank. This device was created to animate him, to give him propulsion and intellect, life from unlife. What happened? It failed, obviously. There was no animation, and even his magnificent form was corrupted. The cost of building and arranging the entire experiment nearly bankrupt me. I regret to hear of this misfortune, sir. I don't need your placations, Klossner. Back to work. Though I did not tell Magda, the incident set off my nerves. The thing's gaze went on to haunt my dreams, and many a night I awoke in cold sweats, gripping my head but unable to purge the image from my mind. My sleepless nights led me to perform poorly at my work. I was caught dozing due to fatigue. I dropped expensive yet fragile components from my shaky hands. I even let a burner overheat so much that another explosion occurred, all because my exhaustion had stolen my attention. Von Klein's temper became more focused throughout these incidents. I was sure that he had come to loathe me and that he was looking for a new assistant. Despite my fears over judicial reprimands, I desired greatly to escape the workshop and to put that chapter of my life behind me. Not long after, the day came when my wizardly master commanded me to drain the tank and lay Kaiser out onto a work table. A writhing anxiety rose within me, and I knew that I would be unable to perform the task. I attempted to make excuses, or even postpone the project, but Von Klein would not hear it. With my every plea, his anger seemed to escalate. At last, when I expected him to terminate my employment, he calmly lowered his posture and advised me to go back to my custodial duties until further notice. At this point, my memory goes completely blank. For a short time, there is nothing. Unlike the many other lost moments in my past, this point I have no interest in uncovering. The next thing I remember is the sensation of cold wetness encompassing my naked body. Then, the discomfort of a tube that extended down through my throat and beyond. I tried to open my eyes, but I was powerfully sedated. I caught a glimpse of a hazy blue-green liquid in which I was suspended, then passed back into the blank void. Then there was a weight, an increasing weight to my body. From the inside out, along with the indescribable sensation of thickness to my skin. I could not tell if I could move my limbs or if it was just my imagination. How long have I been trapped in here? I wondered. I felt like I should panic, but whatever sedative I was under held a firm grasp on me. That and something else. Some strange occupation building within me, replacing feeling with substance, replacing thought with solidity. 
My next emergence from the void came with a great suddenness. The sedation was receding at a rapid pace, and a sharp, powerful sentience was coming to me. My body felt very altered, as if I was no longer flesh and blood, but something new entirely. Within minutes, I was taken with the fact that my mind was working rather differently. I had never been known to possess any particular intellect before, but now I felt keen. I felt capable. I thought back to all the miscellaneous projects I had observed or took part in. I was certain I could master them now, if only given proper time and learning resources. As I rolled over the profoundness of my fantastic mental prowess, I realized that I was feeling nothing emotionally. I was not excited or confused, and neither was I terrified or alarmed. I simply noted the fact that I was now processing information at an incredibly rapid pace, moved on to my next thought. Von Klein walked into the room. Through the liquid haze, I saw him approach the tank and study the settings on the control panel. He meticulously made a couple minor adjustments and then took notes in a leather-bound journal. He stared at me, directly at me, obviously scrutinizing my progress. I would have expected to be revolted by the sight of him. I waited for the anger to well up within me, but it did not come. I felt nothing. I had not a single care for what he had done to me. There was only readiness. I wanted to express to him that I was ready to do more work, but I found myself unable to move my body or speak in any fashion. The glass tube from the panel was still stuck through my mouth and it was delivering a bright liquid to me. Was this more transformative fluid? Was it some sort of sustenance that I required? I wanted the answers badly. There was a momentary flicker of frustration, and then nothing. Von Klein said something to me, which was imperceptible through the thick glass, then exited the room. Time passed. He would check on me most days. Some days he would make notes, or make a slight adjustment or two, and other days he would just stare at me, long and hard. Sometimes he would talk to me, almost like he was carrying on a conversation, but his words were too muffled to make out. I began running through every logical scenario as to why I was not being released yet. I came up with several, though it only provided me a temporary satisfaction. I needed more information. I needed to work. An emotionless impatience began to fill me. I felt like a machine with an engine burning hot, but sitting in neutral. Days turned into weeks, and I began to wonder if I was ever going to be let out of the tank. I still had no functionality to my limbs, which caused me to postulate a number of ideas as to why. It had been so long since I had felt anything. Even the sensation of wetness had dissipated noticeably. I still could feel the weight of my body, but I had quickly gotten accustomed to it. Just when I had forgotten what emotion was, I experienced one like never before. I was in the middle of compiling a mental list of all the objects I had come across in the workshop when a person other than Von Klein strolled into the room. As she came close to my tank, I instantly recognized her. It was Magda. She looked different, however. Stress wrinkles had begun to form on her facial features, and her stomach bulged greatly. She was with child. I began running through my same calculations, futilely attempting to estimate how much time had passed since I had been in suspension. Von Klein entered the room, looking concerned. He came up to Magda, embraced her, and kissed her. I instantly knew what had happened. My disappearance had transferred my debt onto my family name. Von Klein, in an opportunistic and devious move, had coerced Magda into marriage. Settling the debt with the city would have been the equivalent of a noble's dowry. Her refusal would have assured her a lifetime of servitude, as well as the social disgrace of rebuffing a man of a higher class. My Magda, my beloved and dearest treasure, was now the wife of Von Klein, and carrying his seed within her. 
rage boiled within my warped torso. An unquenchable inferno swirled in my head. For all the dehumanizing effects of the transmuting tank, this deeply rooted impulse could not be stamped out. I wanted to scream. I wanted to smash through the walls of the tank. I wanted all this and more, as bad as a being can want. But alas, I was rendered completely immobile. In my silent wrath, I watched the two of them speak. His hands moved over her pregnant stomach. A look of revulsion spread across her face as she studied me, until she was forced to look away. Von Klein commanded her from the room. He paused for a few seconds before leaving, looking at me straight on. I wondered, what was he thinking? Did he know I was conscious? Did I unsettle him the way that I did Magda? The way that Kaiser had done to me? After he left, I stood there, wondering. Had Kaiser been conscious as I had looked upon him? Had he, too, been a man, turned into whatever it is that I am now? Alone in the dark, these questions seared in my mind until I was bound in a hellish prison of my own. There was a sound, a crash. How long had I been lost within my tormented thoughts? Hours? Days? Weeks? I knew not. Judging by the lack of lamplight, it was night. I listened intently. Sounds were muted in the tank. All but the loudest noises were filtered out. A minute later, there was a dim light nearby. Two figures entered my room. Out of the sight of my vision, I could see their silhouettes as they searched through the mass of pieces and parts held in loosely organized storage. They drew closer, men wearing dark clothing and carrying bags and small hooded lanterns. They thieved a number of things and vandalized an entire wall of glass vials. When they got a good look at my tank, they paused. They exchanged glances and words. They tapped on the glass and made jeers at me. One of the men poured over the control panel. He took the liberty of scaling up two of the levers. He watched fluids mix then flow through the tube system, into my mouth. His expression held a brazen delight, along with confused repulsion. The other man took to turning the heavy crank wheel. Once it completed its final rotation, the control panel vibrated violently. The liquids of the tank began to drain, flushing through an unsealed grate in the bottom. At the sight of this, the thieves bolted out of the room, and presumably fled the premise. Anticipation built inside me. I didn't know what was going to happen. The fluid feeding through my tube was different than I had experienced before. I began to feel a strange tingling, starting in my abdomen and spreading out slowly from there. By the time the level of the tank liquid reached my shoulders, I could slightly move my torso and back. With each passing minute, more and more control came to me. Soon, I was in full operation of my body and limbs. Since the tank seal seemed to have been unlocked, I pushed against the glass wall. I swung it open easily, though the sound it made suggested that it was very heavy. Emerging from my womb tomb of glass, liquid, and metal, I took my first step. I spent a while studying how my body felt and moved. I had full possession of my senses of hearing and sight, but the dark of the room kept me from seeing much of anything. My sense of touch was there, but dulled. I observed that I had a sense of weight, balance, and vibrations, but no sense of temperature, pressure, or pain. I wanted to light a lamp, but I found myself fumbling around in the dark with an unfamiliar dexterity. For a moment, I actually considered going back inside the tank. Instead, I opted for exiting the cramped room. I entered a broom closet near the entrance of the building and shut the door. I was accustomed to close space. I waited for the day to come, plotting out my plan with careful deliberation. Before daybreak, however, I heard men entering the workshop. One voice was Von Klein's, and the two others were unknown to me. 
Judging by the soft clinking of mail under tabards, I gleaned that they were guardsmen. I could tell by the way they spoke and acted that someone had noticed the disturbance and alerted the guard. The perpetrators had not been found. I heard them move into my room. Then the sound of Von Klein yelling. He had discovered the room ransacked and my tank empty. By this point, I had already adjusted my plan. I stepped from the broom closet, attempting to be quiet, though I could not discern how much or how little sound I was actually making. Did you hear that? Von Klein rasped. Hear what? replied a guardsman. I heard something. That way. We'll go take a look. The two guardsmen, holding lanterns and swords, moved through the doorway connecting my room to the large entry room. Their yellow light spilled through the darkness and onto my morbid form. They shrieked in horror. I swung a fist at the guard to my right. My bald hand, larger than it once was, and composed of the strange density, connected with his head. His steel helmet crumpled like paper, and the sound of his skull splitting was audible. The other man was wild with fear. As he backed up, he swung his longsword at my left leg. The blade clattered against my pale, warped thigh, creating little more than a scuff mark. I brought my left hand down at him, and he jumped backwards. What in the hell is that thing? The guardsman screamed. This cannot be! No! No! Von Klein was practically paralyzed with terrified denial. I charged the guard and smashed him up against a wall. Shelves and bits came crashing down along with his lifeless body. I turned toward my master and stared him straight on. Please, you're not supposed to be doing this. I gave you power beyond what you ever could have dreamed. Von Klein proceeded to sob and beg. I took a step forward. He reached for his belt and produced an iron rod set in with arcane runes. He sent a dancing spray of white lightning into me. For a second, I felt my body shudder helplessly. The elemental assault ended. Here and there, parts of my metallic skin popped and sent up wisps of black smoke. I grabbed his arm and jerked sharply. Bones cracked, and his artificer rod fell to the floor. He shrieked in pain in a way that I had never before heard. I dragged him across the small room, grabbed his key ring, placed him in the tank, then sealed the door. I studied the control panel for a moment, then primed one of the levers. Liquid began rising up from the base of the tank. Von Klein continued to wail in pain and plead for his life. I simply stood by, watching him drown. My rage burned hot still, though my exterior was surely placid. Inside I churned with the singular drive that I was able to experience. A deed was done but my full plan was still incomplete. Taking Von Klein's key ring, I went to his private office in the back of the workshop. With my newfound strength, I could have broken the door down, but I favored a quieter execution now. I entered the office, where not long ago, I had been signing papers of employment. If only I could have foreseen at that point what macabre fate would befall me. I searched through the mess of Von Klein's office by the light of the dead guardsman's lantern. My late master, in his neurosis, had never given me any indication of his home's whereabouts. Eventually, I came upon a parcel of correspondence from one of Von Klein's personal friends. His address was unfamiliar. I skimmed through the dismantled fragments of my memory, but found nothing there to aid my navigation. A further search turned up a city map, which had been buried within a stack of faded documents. I quickly examined the map, making numerous mental notes. Fueled by the hatred of the bastard seed growing within my love, I resolved to seek out the Von Klein estate immediately, regardless of the impromptu nature of the situation. I fashioned a makeshift hood and cloak and draped it over my figure. I was now a few inches taller than before, and my heavy feet with melded toes protruded boldly from below the garment's hem. Before exiting, I smashed the lit lantern within the study, making sure that a proper blaze would grow to consume the whole of my past workplace. I stepped out into the dark night. The city was large and quiet. 
with the typical fog from the bay settling thick. Through the damp streets and alleys I plodded at a slow pace, doing my best to avoid the notice of the occasional passerby. While the expansive mist aided my concealment, it did make it difficult to read the street markers. I walked for almost an hour, following the mental map I had laid out. At last, I found my way to a neighborhood filled with the homes of successful merchants and minor nobles. I waited in a nearby alleyway for the watchmen of the area to pass by, then approached what I believed was the Von Klein Manor. It was not the most grandiose house, nor the most well-kept, but it surpassed all the cramped dwellings I had ever inhabited. One of the keys on the ring fit the lock, and I slowly opened the front door. With the faintest hint of dawn's coming in the eastern sky, I entered the home to complete my terrible task. The only bedchamber I found on the ground floor was occupied by a servant girl. Knowing that she was a possible liability, I decided to dispose of her. The sound of me drawing near roused her, and as she gasped, I snapped her neck as easily as a person snaps a twig. I next proceeded to ascend the main staircase in the entry chamber. My weighty footsteps upon the creaking boards echoed loudly throughout the silence of the house. I was sure I would be heard. My suspicion was confirmed when I opened the door to the master bedroom to find Magda seated upright in her bed, her turgid expression visible by the light of the lamp on her bedstand. I must have seemed a nightmare manifest, a tall monstrosity with malformed, pallid flesh of some plaster metal, like skin melted, then frozen in place. The hollows of my eye sockets stared out, icy, and with a subtle, detectable anguish. A scream escaped her lips, and her chest began to rise and fall rapidly with frantic breaths, in turn causing her bulging stomach to heave rhythmically. I knew that I had greatly wished to father a child with her. The strength of this former desire was now twisted into the insurmountable disgust that was the sum of my being. Now a grotesque machine, I would never have my love again nor could I undo the cruel placement of the game pieces. I could only level the board. How could you do this? I wanted to shout at her. How could you wed and conceive with the man who took everything away from me? These grim questions thundered within my mind, but when I cracked the shriveled opening of my mouth, no sound escaped. I had no voice. I drew no breath. I was no longer a man, save for this one thing, my all-consuming rage. My cold hands found their way around Magda's throat. Her screams were silenced forever. And so, here is where I stand. What has been done to me, and what I have done in turn, can never be reversed. I have replayed and relived the wrenching scenes again and again. I have tortured myself in this way for what must be years, Though the process is one of agony, it is the final shred of humanity left in me, a frayed and withered strand that I cling to. This painful tether is all that assures me I was once real, and possibly somewhere inside I still am. However, I dread that a day will come when the strand breaks, plunging me into the depths of the unknown. Perhaps I will become an emotionless killer, lumbering through the city at night. Will they assemble a squad specialized to destroy a monster such as myself? Perhaps I will become a mindless automaton, operating solely under the command of whomever discovers me. Or, perhaps I will simply cease to exist, leaving my body behind as some bizarre statue, standing motionless throughout the ages, while every onlooker who views me could never fathom the twisted story held within. <laughs>